Welcome back. In order to get to the point where we can start including some curved design elements in our furniture plans, we really need to get a better handle on circles. We'll also need to get a better handle on ellipses, but we're going to start with circles. And circles are largely the topic of book three of the elements. So we'll start today by laying out all of the definitions from book three and then a selection of the more useful propositions from the point of view of design for, for our purposes. So jumping right in, first definition from book three is, is just establishes what it means for two circles to be equal. And what it says is equal circles are those the diameters of which are equal or the radii of which are equal. So what makes circles equal is if the distance from the center to any point on the perimeter is the same between the two circles or the length passing through the center that cuts the circle twice. Those are equal. So that's all there is to equal circles. Second definition introduces Without using the word, it introduces the idea of tangency. And it says a straight line is said to touch a circle, which meeting the circle and then being produced. So when Euclid says a line is produced, he means that you're extending it indefinitely in either direction. Then it doesn't cut the circle. Okay, and so this is an example of a somewhat sloppily drawn circle and line where that that is the situation. There's this one point where the line touches the circle and when I produce that line arbitrarily far in either direction at no point does it cut the circle through another point. So an example of a line that doesn't just touch a circle it actually cuts it would be this one. Because I extend, this, this meets the circle at this point but if I produce it, if I extend it out further, eventually this left side of the line cuts the circle once more. So this one touches the circle, it's tangent to the circle at this point. The second one that I just drew does not. Well, if a line can be tangent to a circle, or if a line can touch a circle, then two circles ought to be able to do that as well. And that's the subject of definition three of book three. It says circles are said to touch one another, which meeting one another, so meeting one another here, they do not cut one another. In other words, you don't have this one point where the circles meet, and then you trace one or the other circle around further and find that it intersects the other once again. So an example of a, so these two circles touch one another, they are tangent to each other at this point. These two circles they're not tangent. They meet one another here, yet when we continue around one of the circles we find eventually another point where they meet. So that's a cut. We've cut an arc off of that circle. Definition four talks about distances between linear objects, lines, and the center of a circle. And it says in a circle, straight lines are said to be equally distant from the center. So I've got a straight line and another straight line. And we're claiming those are equally distant from the center of the circle. And the way we quantify that, that distance is when we draw a perpendicular from the center of the circle to each of the lines. Now that's a, that's a construction that we can do. We can take a given point and draw a perpendicular to this line that passes through the given point. It's something we learned in book one. So when we construct those perpendiculars, if they happen to be equal to one another, equal in length, then we would say that this line is equally distant from the center of this circle as this line. So. AO equals BO. The two distances are equal. Well, definition five from book three is a follow-up to de definition four. And it just states that 
in the straight line that is said to be at a greater distance on which the greater perpendicular falls. And so it's just Euclid's way of saying that this line is at a greater distance from the center of this circle than this line is because the perpendicular drawn from the center to this first line is longer than this perpendicular. So he's just continuing to compare distances between line segments or lines and the center of a circle. But definition six introduces a new kind of figure, so this is something that's really new. A segment of a circle is a figure. Remember, a figure is a rectilineal figure with something that was contained by um, straight lines and angles. So this is a different figure. This is not necessarily contained by straight lines anymore. It's, it's a figure contained by a curve. And uh, so a segment of a circle is a figure contained by a straight line and a circumference of a circle. So I feel the need to translate a little bit here in terms of old language versus modern language. This line segment that's cutting the circle is called a chord, and this, which Newton is calling a, a um, circumference, we more typically call that an arc of a circle these days. So we usually reserve the word circumference for the entire perimeter of a circle. Euclid didn't. So this is a part of the circumference. This is a chord. When you join those together, you get a segment of a circle. And that's what I've shaded here in the, the chalk. Now, this other piece could have also been a segment of a circle as well, because it is also contained by an arc of the circle and um, a chord. We would also refer to the shorter of these two arcs as the minor arc, the longer of the two arcs as the major arc. Again, that's more of a modern terminology. Euclid's next two definitions have to do with certain angles and how they relate to a segment of a circle such as this one, this figure contained between a circumference and a straight line. Okay, so the first definition is definition seven, and it says that an angle of a segment, and that word of is going to be important, an angle of a segment is contained by, or is that contained by a straight line and a circumference of a circle. And so to make sense of this, what you have to do is remember that Euclid introduced angles that don't necessarily have legs that are straight lines. Angles that have legs that are straight lines are rectilineal angles, but not all angles have to be that way. An angle can just be um, a place where two curves intersect. And that's what's going on here. So this angle right here is an angle of a segment. Again, that word of is important because it distinguishes this defined term from the next one, which is an angle in a segment. So an angle in a segment is the angle which, when a point is taken on the circumference. So let's, let's work with this other segment down here, this part that is, this figure that is contained by this circumference and this straight line. So an angle in that segment is the angle which, when a point is taken on the circumference of the segment, let's take this point right here, and the straight lines are joined from that point, from it, to the extremities of the straight line, which is the base of the segment. is contained by the straight line so joined. Okay, so here's the angle. Here's the angle in a segment that he's talking about. That's an angle in a segment. So this is definition eight. This is definition seven.
So in the next two definitions, Euclid continues exploring the relationship between angles and circles and, and uh, circumferences and segments. So definition nine tells us when the straight line's containing the angle. So he's continuing to talk about an angle in a segment here. So, and when the straight lines containing the angle cut off a circumference, the angle is said to stand upon that circumference. So these two straight lines, they contain an angle in a segment. And these two straight lines cut off the segment from the circle. So they stand upon that segment. And the next definition looks at a different type of angle and the figure that it creates relative to the circle. It says that a sector of a circle, and this is not to be confused with our tool, the sector that we use for establishing proportions. This is a sector of a circle. And it's a figure which, when the angle is constructed at the center of the circle, so this angle was constructed on the perimeter of the circle, Here's one. It's constructed at the center. And so the sector of the circle is a figure which when an angle is constructed at the center of the circle, that's what we just did, is contained by the straight lines, so this figure is contained by these two straight lines that contain the angle, and then the circumference cut off by them, by this. So, I'll color it in. This region that's contained by those two straight lines that contain the angle, the legs of the angle in other words, and then the arc of the circle that they cut off, the circumference of the circle that they cut off, that's what makes up a sector of a circle. Well, we've come to the last definition of book three. And it's kind of an odd one because it's not really a good definition. It tacitly assumes a proposition that we won't prove until, well, we won't prove at all, but Euclid doesn't prove until much later in book three. Um, but we'll get to that. that. That's not really the point here. What this definition says is that, well, it's defining similar segments of two different circles. Now remember, a segment is just if you take a chord of a circle and then the arc that that chord cuts from the circle, the figure is the region contained by those two pieces. And so what Euclid's getting at here is he's saying that if you've got two different circles, Similar segments are those which admit equal angles or in, that word in versus on again, in which the angles are equal to one another. So look at what we've done here. I've drawn two circles with a segment cut from each one of them. And in that segment, I've drawn an angle here and here. Now, if we got out a protractor and measured that angle, we would see that those angles are equal. Or as close as I can manage with a piece of chalk, they're equal. And so Euclid's saying that those two segments are similar. And they, they look like it, right? If you scale one up, it should look about the same as this one. Um, he's saying that they're similar because this angle is equal to this angle. But not only that, is that if we took any other point along the perimeter, the circumference of this, this, um, this circle here, and drew an angle in this segment from it, then it would also be equal to this. And vice versa, any other angle on this segment that I draw would be equal to this. They're all, all equal. And that's, that's the difficult part here, is that that's actually a statement that needs to be just within one circle. If I were to draw more angles on that segment, they're all going to be equal. And that's, 
that, that's not something that's obvious. That's something that we have to prove, and it gets proved later on in book three. So this is a kind of an odd definition in the sense that it, it dances around this concept that we sort of need to make sense of the definition, yet we haven't proved yet. I bring it up because that concept, the fact that these angles are all equal within one, the angles um, in a, a segment, they're all equal, that's a concept that we're going to use. It's going to be a concept that's helpful to us for building a device that allows us to lay out a certain kind of curve in our designs. So that's really the only reason why I bring up this somewhat flawed definition rather than just skipping it until we can prove the components of it that we need. Welcome back. With our definitions from book three in place, we also need to establish some of Euclid's propositions related to circles, and in particular related to how we construct circles given various kinds of pieces of input information. And so the very first proposition in book three, proposition one, just does that. It's, it allows you to find the center of a given circle so that perhaps we could copy that circle to other locations. So if all we've got is this circle and we don't know where its center is, then what we're going to do is pick any two points. I suggest taking them somewhat separate from each other. That'll aid with accuracy. Any two points on the circumference of the circle. Call those A and B. And then we're going to connect them to make a chord of the circle. Then, Euclid has us bisect that segment AB, and that was one of our constructions from book one. So I'll go ahead and perform that. Basically, it's a double equilateral triangle construction. And the second step after bisecting AB at this point, it's going to be its midpoint, is that we can construct a perpendicular line that passes through AB at that point. Conventionally, you can do those two steps with one operation, which is this double equilateral triangle construction that I just performed. By connecting the vertices, the third vertices of, of the two equilateral triangles that share AB as a common base. So that's a perpendicular, that's point D. And then where that perpendicular intersects the circumference of the circle, we'll call those points E and C. Well, now Euclid has us bisect EC, this new line, at a midpoint F. And again, we can do that simply with a double equilateral triangle construction, provided I've got enough space. Yeah, I do. And if I were to connect those two lines to those two intersections here with a new line, then that would be the perpendicular bisector of EC. But all I really need to do is mark where it intersects EC because that's it's going to be point F, the midpoint of this chord. And we say that that is the center of the circle. It turns out that that's true. So. Steps are to find any chord intersect that cuts the circle, bisect, well, lay out the perpendicular bisector of that chord, and then find the perpendicular bisector of the perpendicular bisector, 
and that's going to pass right through the center. So I'm not going to prove that. I'm not going to prove the uh, correctness of of this this proposition. Uh, Euclid does, and it's basically a, a a proof by contradiction. So it's something that we haven't really spent much time on in this class. But basically, you would the way it works is that you assume some other point G is the center of the circle, and then you start drawing logical deductions from that assumption and eventually arrive at something that's impossible. So then the only rational conclusion at that point is that G couldn't be the center, had to be F. Had, you know, the F is the only logical choice. Um, and that, you know, it takes another page of work. It's more important for us at this point just to be able to perform the construction and find that center. Now, before we move on to the next next um, idea with this, I want to, well, definitely before we move on to the next proposition, I, I want you to think about some of the operations that happened here. Now, we were trying to find the center of the circle, and we did so uh, by establishing an arbitrary chord, finding its perpendicular bisector, and then that perpendicular bisector might as well have just been another chord of the circle, and we found its perpendicular bisector. That's, I didn't draw it, but that's what this line would have been connecting those two intersections. And so this perpendicular bisector of a chord and this perpendicular bisector of a chord happen to intersect at the center of the circle. And so we want to generalize that idea. We want to take the idea that, look, if we took two chords of a circle and found their perpendicular bisectors, perhaps we should expect that, not just in this case, but in all cases, they're going to intersect at the center of the circle. And it turns out that that is true. That is the consequence of Proposition 5 of the next book in the Elements. And it's a book that we're not going to really spend any time on in this video series, uh, just because we're running out of time. Um, what Proposition 5 allows you to do is take a triangle and understand that those three vertices on the triangle could be the co two chords, the endpoints of two chords of some circle. And so if we were to find the perpendicular bisectors of those two chords, then we could find the center of that circle by just looking for where they intersect. And I'm, I'm just going to demonstrate that because that is a useful technique for some of the things that we're going to do. Maybe a consequence isn't the right word, but what I'm going to look at here is a generalization of some of the ideas that are used in the construction of Proposition 1. And so we can imagine if we had these three points, I'd like to construct a circle that passes through those three points, or at least a circular arc that passes through those three points. And it turns out that that's possible to do, and we can use this notion of perpendicular, now we haven't proved it, but we can use the notion that perpendicular bisectors of chords of circles are all going to pass through the center of that circle. And so if these three points are indeed on the circumference of a circle, then if I connect any two of them with a line segment, then that line segment should be a chord of that circle. So I've now I've got two chords of the circle, even though I don't yet have the circle itself. So what I can do with those chords is find their perpendicular bisectors with our double equilateral triangle construction. Oh, that's, that's not going to work. That's better. 
chalkboard compasses are not the same as working with a precision stare tool. There's the perpendicular bisector of AB. Let's get the perpendicular bisector of BC. two intersections. And then I see the two perpendicular bisectors intersect at this point. And so what I should be able to do if I was careful and precise and swinging my arcs, that I ought to take my compass, put the point at this intersection, and then verify that the marking tip touches all three of those points. So all three of those points are the same distance from this. So they must lie on the circle with this radius in this center. And I can now see that by swinging the arc that connects them. And then if I want to, continue it all the way around to get a circle. So I fit a circle to three points. Or I fit, if I just start here and end here, I fit a circular arc to three points. And so that, that actually is one way of solving the problem. You know, if we have, I'll just freehand it. If we have some rectangular space that we've laid out in one of our designs, and we want to fit an arc in that space that just touches this line segment on the top at its midpoint and then cuts through these two corners. You know, something that's just going to look freehanded. It's not very circular, but something like that. If I actually wanted to construct that carefully, well, this construction that we just kind of intuitively came up with by generalizing Proposition 1 would work because I've got three points defined on a circle that I want a circular arc to pass through. So all I'd have to do is find those two segments, find their perpendicular bisectors, that's not a very good freehand sketch, where they intersect is the center, set my compass to that distance, and then swing the arc. You know, so that's one solution to that problem. And if you were watching as I was revising the design of the SITS tool, I put these um, I put these arcs on the end, two ends of the seat, on the, you know, the, the seat platform on top of that stool. And the overall rectangle of the stool looks something like this. Those side rectangles that were really indicating the amount of rectangle that was overhanging from the stool's legs. And so I just fit in that demonstration some arcs that fit into those spaces. All right, and so that, that was a construction that I ended up using there. And again, we've not proven it, uh, but it's, it's basically a, a construction that could be inspired from what we learned about the techniques from Proposition 1 of Book 3. Propositions 11 and 12 of Book 3 are both similar in that they, they they address what it means for two circles to touch each other or to be tangent to one another at a point. And so the first of these, Proposition 11, says that if two circles touch each other internally and their centers are taken, and the straight line joining their centers, if it is also produced, if it's extended, it's going to fall on the point of contact of the circles. And so I've, I've drawn two circles 
that touch internally. I've got the smaller circle is on the interior of the larger, and they just touch their tangent at this one point of contact. So if I were to find the center of the smaller circle and the center of the larger circle and connect them with a straight line, and then extend that straight line, it turns out that that always passes through the point of tangency. Okay. This is going to be a technique that is pretty useful for working get some colored chalk here. Oh, there it is. It's going to be pretty useful for working with piecewise circular curves, meaning they're curves that are made up of circular arcs that are joined together smoothly at different points. And so one example of those is imagine if we took this outer circle and traced it around a quarter of the way until we reach this point of tangency. And then jumped onto the inner circle and got a quarter of the way around it. Well, you can imagine maybe continuing that process indefinitely. Because we find the line that connects B to this point on the small circle that's a quarter of the way down and do a smaller circle. using that new center. And that gives you another arc, another circular arc, that you could jump on, go another quarter of the way around. And if you continue that process, you're going to get this spiraling curve that comes inward. And that's an example of a classical curve in architecture and furniture design as well, known as a volute. And we'll explore an example of a volute in much more detail in, in our next video. Proposition 12 gives us a very similar result. It states that if two circles touch each other externally rather than internally, and their centers are taken, it's A and B, and the straight line joining their centers, segment AB, is going to fall on the point of contact. And this time the point of contact is between the two circles right here at P. So it's still going to tell us what it means for circles to be tangent. It's just this time they are externally tangent. And so an application of this proposition is that it gives us some insight into how to construct different families of wave-like curves. And so if I imagine taking a arc of the big circle, let's maybe take the one that's one-sixth of the way around. Um, I'll just measure that by finding the radius of the circle, stepping off one-sixth from this point of contact. And then the same thing on this little circle. Find the radius and step A. I'll do it over here. So I've found the radius. I'm going to measure that step from the point of contact part way around the arc. So if I do that, imagine taking this part of the circular arc the big circle to the point of contact and then jumping off of the big circle onto the small circle picking up the sixth of an arc from the small circle and then I get this smooth somewhat graceful S-shaped curve and instead of a volute which was the piecewise circular cur uh, curve that we would get when we 
jump from internally tangent circle to internally tangent circle, we get what's called a SEMA curve. And we'll also explore SEMA curves somewhat in detail in the next video. So, the point of propositions 11 and 12 is that both of them give us some insight into ways that we can construct some complex curves made up of simple circular arcs, just joined end to end, that can appear in our designs. So you'll see volutes appear on the spirals of a fiddlehead, uh, you know, the headstock of a violin. Uh, you'll see them appear on the crest rails and the armrests of certain Windsor chairs. You'll see them on the tops of Ionian uh, um, columns in classical um, Greek architecture. Sema curves are often used to produce wave-like patterns in uh, classic crests on fancier furniture, or you can use them to generate s smoothly flowing curved leg profiles for tables. You know, they, the more that you look for them, the more that you start to see them in furniture design. So the, this, this kind of a technique will come back to us. And we'll explore how to construct arcs like this somewhat efficiently. The volutes, there's, there's really nothing efficient about drawing a volute. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty slow and painstaking process, but we'll see how it works. The next few propositions, propositions 16 through 19 of book three, all have to do with tangent relationships between straight lines and circles. So what's it mean for a straight line to be tangent uh, to a point on the circumference of a circle? So proposition 16 is a little bit of a mouthful, but here's what it says. This is a straight line drawn at right angles to the diameter of a circle from its extremity. All right. Here's the diameter. Here's a straight line drawn at right angles from an extremity of that diameter. So the straight line drawn at right angles to the diameter of a circle from its extremity will fall outside of the circle. Well, that, that it does. And into the space between that straight line and the circumference of the circle. So into this horn-shaped space right here, another straight line cannot be interposed. And so what he means is that you cannot take a straight line passing through this point and somehow fit it into this space in a way that doesn't either cut the circle elsewhere or coincide, or even worse, fall on the bottom side of this, this perpendicular line. It's impossible, so he's stating that. Further, the angle of the semicircle, all right, now remember, Euclid allows for angles to have curves as its legs. So the angle of the semicircle is this. He says that angle is greater, and then the remaining angle such brittle chalk. That there, that's the remaining angle. That's less than any acute rectilineal angle. And so what he's really doing is just restating in maybe more precise ways that there's no way that you can take a line Pick any line, straight line, from the right angled intersection here and draw it above this perpendicular. Well, this angle, this rectilineal angle, is greater than this acute angle because it falls above, or, or, or the, this, this remaining angle, uh, because it falls above it for a while right here. And it's less than the angle of the semicircle because again it falls inside the opening of the semicircle for a while. 
It's just another way of saying that if you try to take a straight line and interpose it in this space right here, you can't, no matter how you draw it. No matter how much I shrink this line down towards here, it's always going to cut the circle a little bit. And so what Proposition 16 really does is give us, maybe precise isn't the right word, but more of a precise sense of what it means for a line to be tangent to a circle at a point relative to the angles that are involved at that point of tangency. Where is Proposition 16 mostly is telling us about what it means for a line to be tangent to a circle at a point. Proposition 17 goes about the nuts and bolts problem of how do we construct a line that's tangent to a circle. In particular, it tells us if we've got some given point, can we draw a straight line touching the circle through that point? All right, so here's our point. Here's our circle with a known center C. Here's what we need to do. First, we're going to connect our point to the center of the circle. We're going to construct segment PC. Then, we're going to construct a circle that's concentric with the first one. It shares the same center, but it's got radius equal to this new segment PC that we just constructed. I'm probably going to overlap some of what I wrote said at the midpoint. I don't really mean that. I'm going to construct a perpendicular here to PC at this point of intersection. So B is where PC intersects our first circle. And I want to construct a perpendicular there. Uh, I'm going to use a layout square. You could do the perpendicular line construction if you want. Uh, I'm going to hope that the layout square works well enough for me today. Okay. So there's my, my perpendicular. Now that perpendicular is going to intersect this, so this is perpendicular line here. It's going to intersect the outer circle excuse me, right here at point Q. So we'll label that intersection Q. And then I want to connect that intersection to the center of the circle as well. So I'm going to draw line segment QC. Now, QC intersects that inner circle at a point A. I'll label it A. And if I connect P, a given point, to A, that it's just going to touch that circle there with a right angle to this radial line that extends out through the circle. Now we can, we can pretty much prove that using, um, using something, using our angle uh, congruence, our triangle congruence rules. Um, so we're not going to take the time to do it. It's a pretty 
pretty straightforward proof that that's the set of steps that you would go through in order to draw a line through this given point P that's tangent to the circle. Now, I could have done a mirror image of this construction as well. Um, namely, I could have drawn this perpendicular going off in this direction, and that would have allowed me to find another point of tangency somewhere over here. So there's typically two points of tangency um, to any circle that can be, uh, or two tangent lines to any circle that can be drawn through some given point outside of the circle. Well, propositions 18 and 19 work together to give us a fairly useful fact about um, tangents and diameters. So 18 says that the straight line touches a circle. So that's what's happening down here. The straight line is touching the circle. It's tangent to the circle. And another straight line is drawn from the center to the point of tangency, to the point of contact. The straight line so joined will be perpendicular to the tangent. So if you've got a tangent line, you connect the center of the circle to the point of tangency, then the angle that that segment makes with the line which touches the circle guaranteed to be right. Proposition 19 really just says the converse of that. If a straight line touches a circle, and from the point of contact, you construct a perpendicular, then that perpendicular is going to pass through the center of the circle. So, what these two are really saying together in concert is that a line passing through the endpoint of a circle's diameter is a tangent line if and only if the diameter and that line passing through the endpoint intersect at right angles. Right. And so what they really do is they give us a way of constructing a tangent line through a point on the circle. Connect the point on the circle to the, the uh, center and then draw a perpendicular through that point and the result will be a tangent line. So we're able to now construct tangent lines to a circle that passed through some external point. That was the subject of Proposition 17, and we can also construct tangent lines to a circle that passed through a given point on its perimeter. One of the main uses of tangents to circles is that, let me erase some of this now. A lot of times you don't want to design furniture or other objects in high traffic areas with sharp edges. And so that's why if you look at your tabletops, they often have a rounded corner. And so this idea of tangency can help you to take a rectilineal figure like that and say, I want to round off this corner with a circular radius. Well, find maybe you want the radius to be this distance here. These two points need to be points of tangency for some circle, so we just need to go about finding the center of that circle so that we can swing you know, a circular arc with our compass. and round off that edge. So we might see some of these constructions appearing in some of our designs if, if we are trying to round off sharp corners. There's other applications as well, and those will likely turn up in um, either our next video where we lay out certain types of, of complex curves using the basic building block ideas that are coming out of book three or in one of our design workshops in the future. The remaining propositions that we're going to look at from book three are all 
Well, some of them have their individual uses, but together they're all going to support kind of a difficult construction that we're going to look at in our next video lesson, in our next tutorial. And what that construction is, it, it, it's a way of solving this problem that we keep coming back to of what happens when you want to inscribe an arc into a rectangle, passes through the two corners on the long side, and then is tangent to the midpoint of the opposite side. Now, we've got ways that we've already seen that we can construct that arc with a compass and a straight edge. And the, the problem with that is that what if you need to lay out that arc on a workpiece for a large piece of furniture, or even maybe in a more extreme situation, if you are laying out an architectural element inside of a house or a building, you're trying to design a big arch that's going to support uh, a ceiling. And you need to lay out that pattern. You probably don't have a compass that can you know, span 16 feet. I'm sure you can make a trammel point, but it, it really gets to be pretty awkward to work with stuff like that. So it turns out that there is a, a, a linkage of basically two rulers that we stick together um, in a hinge, much in you know, the way that a sector looks, um, that we'll be able to use to, to mark out the arc that, that I just erased. It's easy to build one of these devices, and it's reasonably easy to use it, although if it's on a very large scale project, you might need uh, some helpers to help hold things steady. But it's, it's less obvious to see why that linkage works. So Proposition 20 and the remaining propositions that we're going to look at from Book 3 are all tools that we'll need to support the why of that linkage. Why does it work? So, what Proposition 20 tells us is that if we've got some circle and we've got some arc specified on that circle, then we can, con we can construct an angle of that arc whose vertex is at the center of the circle. So that is angle AOB. And then we can also lay out an angle um, whose vertex, angle of the arc, AB, whose vertex is point C somewhere on the circumference of the circle, ACB. And so what Proposition 20 does for us is that it establishes the relationship between those two angles. And it says the measure of this angle at the center is always going to be twice the measure of the angle um, whose vertex lies on the, the perimeter, on the circumference. Proposition 22 is the second really critical proposition for making sense of why the linkage I've described works. And it just says that if you've got a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle, the opposite angles on that quadrilateral are going to, their measures are going to sum up to two right angles or what Euclid means by that is 180 degrees or pi radians if you prefer. So what he's saying is that angle A plus angle C is equal to 180 degrees or pi radians. And the same is because A and C are opposite angles in that quadrilateral. And the same is true for B and D. In other words, the opposite angles are supplementary. Proposition 25 from Book 3 is another construction proposition. And what it says is that if we are given a segment of a circle, and remember a segment of a circle is one of our design, it's one of our defined terms from Book 3, and all a segment is is it's a figure that's contained by an arc of a circle and then the chord of the circle that connects its endpoints. So these are all segments of circles that I've drawn here. So Proposition 25 says, given a segment of a circle to describe a complete circle of which it is a segment. In other words, if you were, to give, if you were given one of these three figures, 
how would you go about finding the center of the circle that those segments were cut from so you could reconstruct the entire circle? Now, Euclid organizes his construction from Proposition 25 and his proof that it work, those constructions work by three cases where your segment is made up, case one is where your segment is made up of a minor arc of a circle in the chord that connects it. Case two is where your, your arc is actually a semicircle, it's a half circle, and the chord that connects it is the diameter of the circle. And then case three is where you're working with a major arc of a circle and the chord that connects its endpoints. For our purposes, we're really only going to be interested in this first case. And so that's the only part of the construction of, uh, that, that comes from book, book three, Proposition 25, that I'm going to show. The others are very similar, and they're proved in similar ways. Uh, just a little bit of bookkeeping that you've got to do to, to uh, account for the differences between them. So here's how the construction for the first part of Proposition uh, 25 works. So we're, we're given our arc of some circle. The arc is AB. First thing that we're going to do is bisect the chord of the arc. And we're going to construct a perpendicular through the midpoint of that chord, and we're going to extend that perpendicular so that it also passes through um, the arc itself. And I'm going to just do that all in one process. It's our, you know, as usual, it's our double equilateral triangle construction for bisecting segments and angles and creating perpendiculars. Oh, Extend that line just a little bit longer. Hoping I've got enough room here. I think I probably should. Alright. Erase some of my straight lines so this doesn't get too messy. But I do need to label. Let's see, this is midpoint is point C. This point up here is point D. Okay, so I've taken care of steps one, two, three. Um, and now what I'm going to do is draw a line segment that connects points D and B. Uh, let's try to be a little neater than that, or I'm going to have problems here later on. Tough with chalk. All right, now that's a little better. All right, so there's segment DB. Now, what I want to do with segment DB is that I would like to copy this angle, angle CDB. I'd like to copy it onto this leg that it will have in common but I want the new vertex to be here at point B. So I want to have some line that's coming off of point B so that this angle equals that angle. And I just have to use the copy and angle construction from book one. So I'm going to take a distance on DB, mark it, mark it on to this ray DC, and I'm going to flip the compass and mark that same distance on DB, but from point B. And then continue to swing the arc wider. Now I measure the distance between my two intersections on DB. And, oh, it looks like it's pretty closely measured already. So I measured the distance between the two intersections on segment DB, the chord, 
and then this perpendicular bisector that's good, so that's the ray through DNC. Then I'm going to copy that distance or transfer that distance between where that big arc intersects DB and somewhere on itself. And that intersection right here should be a line that I can draw. I should be able to draw a line through B and that intersection that copies this angle to here. So those angles I claim are the same by our construction from book one that tells us how to copy angles. All right, now that new leg of this angle, D, B, let's call it E, intersects our original perpendicular bisector to AB at this point here. And that's the point E that I'm choosing to leave. That point E should be the center of our circle. So I should be able to now reconstruct this entire circle that this circular arc or this segment of the circle came from. And all I've got to do is put my compass point at E and adjust its opening so it reaches to really any point on the arc. Try to get it accurate. And so we'll see if it works. It doesn't work well when the compass moves on you, but you can see that I'm, you know, reasonably doing a reasonably good job of retracing the arc and then extending it so that I get the full circle. Okay, well, why would you care? This is this is related. This problem of reconstructing a circle from a given arc is related to the problem that we keep coming back to of embedding or inscribing a circular arc into a rectangle. And here's why it's related. Um, this arc, we can really summarize it with three points two endpoints, and then any other point that we choose on the arc itself, but we might as well choose the point that we get by finding the perpendicular bisector to the core of the arc, so the midpoint of the arc, in other words. All right, so three points on the arc, the endpoints and the midpoint, in a sense, define the arc. And so I could have just as easily said, can I reconstruct the center of the circle that this arc came from by knowing those three points? All right, well, that's really no different than taking the bottom two corners of the rectangle and the midpoint of the opposite edge of the rectangle and say, can I construct an arc or a circle that passes through those three points? Now, again, we've already got a way to do that. I've shown you that we can just, look, we can connect to those two segments, find their perpendicular bisectors, and when that, wherever they intersect should be the center of that arc. And that's still the way that I would recommend constructing that arc. Um, so that was the, the generalization or the, the consequence of, of proposition one that I looked at from, uh, from book three. But the benefit of this approach, where we're just saying, look, find this line, find this line, and then copy this angle to here, that's going to work also. And the benefit of it is that if we were still in the business of proving our propositions, we could do it at this point. We'd have enough in place to say that this is true. This, this works all of the time. And to prove the approach that was my generalization of proposition one, where you form the perpendicular bisector and the perpendicular bisector, we'd have to and see where they intersect to find the center of our arc that we want. We'd have to do a little bit more. We'd have to go into book four. Now, the reason why I like that perpendicular bisector approach is just for whatever reason, even with my crummy chalkboard compass, 
I'm able to construct the perpendicular bisectors a little bit more accurately than I can copy an angle. Frankly, I'm surprised that this worked out as well as it did in this particular example. It's often hard for me to copy an angle accurately, and it's just because that is a construction that I think is very sensitive to small errors. So if I've got to, with a compass and straight edge, fit an arc to the interior of a rectangle, I'll probably still jump ahead and use the perpendicular bisector approach as opposed to this one. It's just nice to know that this one works and could be proven in principle if we were in the business of doing that. And so that's why it appears here in this set of propositions. Propositions 27 and 29 are related to one another, and they're the last two propositions that we're going to look at in this tutorial. So Proposition 27 says that if you've got two equal circles, and I've drawn two circles with the same radius, so they're, they're equal. If you've got two equal circles, angles standing on equal circumferences. So I've got an arc, A, B, here, and I've got another arc, C, D, here. If those are equal, and they are, then the angles are going to be equal to one another regardless of whether they stand at the centers or on the circumferences. And so what we mean by that is that since AB is an arc that's equal to CD, this angle at the center equals this angle at the center in the other circle. And likewise, this angle that spans arc AB is equal to this angle that spans the equal arc CD. Proposition 29 says something similar, except it's no longer talking about angles. It says in equal circles, equal, equal circumferences, so again, AB is an arc, a circumference that's equal to CD. They are subtended by equal straight lines. In other words, the chords of those equal circumferences from equal circles must be equal. So what he's saying is that segment AB and segment CD they've got to be congruent to each other. They've got to be the same length. Okay, and so those are just two last facts that can be useful to us as we're establishing why this linkage that I keep referring to, this linkage for constructing an arc that is inscribed inside of a rectangle, why it works. And so when we meet again, we're going to take these definitions and propositions from book three and start applying them to different techniques that are used and have been used for um, centuries now, millennia in fact, um, for design, for creating curves that get added or embedded into your design. Um, that's going to be really just a menu of techniques. Um, and in some cases, I'll show them in context of you know, where they'd maybe fit within some design task. Um, but we're going to just establish them as techniques by themselves, for the most part, first in that tutorial so that when we move into another design workshop, we can start applying them really in earnest to different tasks that come up when we're laying out design elements of, of pieces of furniture. So uh, thanks for watching and um, we'll see you next time.